Hi everybody, welcome back. Oh my goodness, this is always driving me bonkers. Uh, so, what's new? We have a test on Thursday. Um, I'm glad to hear that therapeutics has been pushed a little bit, so that's good. So we just have Dr. Selvage and I still at the end of this week. Um, I think that's helpful that you don't have your first therapeutic exam right away. But. Um, so we did this pre-lecture quiz. Uh, most of them were handed in well ahead of time. Um, so I thought today, uh, as I sent the email, we are now reviewing. Um, so I brought my learning objectives. Um, what I do first is going to go over the quiz and go over this content. We just have a few slides to go over. Um, cover those brief learning objectives, and then I thought I would entertain any sort of questions um, that you had. Um, I put out the study guide to give you a, a even more of a framework to study with. I saw Dr. Selvage did that, took that approach. Um, I hope that's helpful. Um, if there's any sort of modification I can make to that for the next exam, I, I'm all ears. We'll see how it goes for this one. Um, there's other some sort of study guides that, that I can make. I don't know how much more guidance um, I can give, but I, I'm willing to try it in a different manner if, if that's at all good for you guys. Um, so uh, this is the biggest I can make this here, and I just made a quick PDF printout of uh, the quiz. So let's go through the questions. I think they're all in the same order for everybody. Um, that everybody did the Google form. The Google form approach is what I often did in previous years for all of my pre-lecture quizzes. Um, but I'm encouraged to use ExamSoft this year by various administrative personnel, so that's why I've changed a little bit. All right, so let's start. Uh, why was benzoyl atropine used as a model compound in the design of brocaine? Anyone want to comment? Start off. And if anybody's feeling good. Um, because it lacked the uh, methyl ester that uh, gave it so addictive to uh, the profile of cocaine. Mm -hmm. um, what was it where its clinical properties did it have? Did it have an aesthetic? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a lot of nods there. So it was, so they tested it and they found that it had some significant anesthetic properties, and just by eliminating that methyl ester, they, um, yeah, they found out that it essentially lost all its addic addictive properties. Um, so yeah, so it's the uh, uh, no methyl ester, no addiction, and uh, still an anesthetic. Good. Right. So a more general question here is, uh, how does the chemical structure of benzoyl atropine differ from the chemical structure of procanes? Do you want to continue on that line? Somebody else. They they broke the tropine ring. Tropane yeah. is it tropane or tropine? Can you can you you've used both terms? Can you define them for us? What is it? That's a great question. So, the tropine has the oxygen attached, whereas yeah. the tropane does not. Is that the difference? Yes. Yeah, so them? the tropine rings that are referred to in the cholinergic section have that oxygen have that a hydroxyl group, um, sort of the opposite side of the nitrogen. Um, so that makes it a tropene. We're actually looking at a more general structure of the tropene itself, which is which is just that, um, just that um, bicyclic system that has a nitrogen in it. That's common in atropine. It actually is an atropine and scopolamine. Um, so yeah, it's a simplified version. It's the tropene ring. So that's what they did. They they, if you it's you know it was not as easy to see with my slides. Um, I won't bring them up quite yet, but it was it was that ring system was essentially deconstructed. There was the same number of carbons um, in the precursor to propane, which is called 
Amalokane. Amalokane. Yeah, so that intermediate, which is not really therapeutically um, useful, but if you look at the number of carbons and everything, they essentially just broke open that ring, but there's essentially the same number of carbons, and then a little bit of simplification gave them procaine, and procaine is the prototype that came from that. All right, so, uh, so we'll just comment on the tropane ring um, itself, and that that was, deep, that was uh, deconstructed. Uh, let's see, so briefly we compare the aqueous solubility of ester versus amino acid, local anesthetics, pretty straightforward. Let me just scroll here. So, anyone? Real straightforward? Does Dr. Mizuno actually, yeah? Um, the uh, ester group and the uh, ester anesthetic is more susceptible to hydrolysis? Yeah, it's a, it's a distinction I think is important, and I, um, I actually uh, neglected to go back and actually check how, how much Dr. Mizuno talked about that, but esters in an aqueous solution um, are susceptible to the acid and base hydrolysis, right? If it's, in this suit, it's a solution of slightly acidic or slightly base, they will fall apart over time. Amides are much more resistant. Um, amides are common in a lot of drug structures. They're in amino acid chains. Um, they're much more, it requires a lot more um, harsh conditions. It actually requires laboratory conditions to, to essentially break them up unless you have an enzyme helping so the esters are less stable if they're, so this, this points um, just in a clinical or rather in a pharmacy sense, um, it just means that aqueous solutions that you might make, say an IV solution or some, or some sort of preparation, you have to consider the stability of the drug. Um, an ester, local anesthetic, will not last as long. That product won't last as long on the shelf. What drug may be administered to an increase in strength and duration effect of both of these local anesthetics? Mm -hmm. Epinephrine. Epinephrine. Why? Because because vasoconstriction kind of keeps it in that local area. Yes, you're talking about a local anesthetic, so it makes sense. I had a typo on the on the on the slides, right? And I, I indicate epinephrine as a vasodilator incorrectly. It's in fact a vasoconstrictor. So it sort of makes technical sense that if you're doing an injection, you want a local effect. Constricting the blood vessels will prevent the just distribution of that drug. Um, so it'll slow down, it, it won't prevent it, it'll slow down the distribution of the drug. So it's a more um, intense and prolonged local effect. Great. And then finally, what structural changes to amino acid local anesthetics cause an increased duration of effect? What is the word I'm looking for? Physical property. Right. So we're talking about lipophilicity. It's, I, I showed, gave you a series of structures and essentially moving from left to right, um, there was an increase in the number of alkyl groups on them. They had more lipophilic character. They had an increased duration of action. So um, I think that kind of covers those learning objectives. We only had like five or six slides of actual content. Are there any other questions or concerns with those slides? Or I mean, I could uh, open them up. <clears throat> I should um, address them, I guess. So I broke them up into two separate groups. Um, I, you know, it's not necessarily that clinically you would refer to them as ester and amino amide. Um, I should point that out. Um, you should be cognizant of each type, and they, have, they are separate types. Uh, maybe they would be, um, but I'm using them for classification purposes here because historically they came from a slightly different place. Even though they're both alkaloids. Um, there's the tropane ring that we were mentioning. Um, the methyl ester group of cocaine over here, which is responsible for the addictive qualities. Um, there's our tropane. Um, our tropine hydroxyl would be right here. Mm 
We took benzoyl atropine. See, this actually <laughs> is just a view from the top. Um, it's kind of easier to see the connectivity as we're breaking this a ring system apart, going in this direction. Um, if you look between the oxygen and the nitrogen here, um, there are one, two, three carbons. And between the oxygen and nitrogen here, there are one, two carbons. This is not going to be on the test, but look, why is that shorter, do you suppose? Anybody have an idea? Like, Well, let me put it another way. So the nitrogen and the oxygen are, are fixed in space here. There, this relationship on the tropane ring they're all, they're actually combined in that tropane ring. They're attached to each other. So if we want to simplify the structure until an alkyl chain, like this whole middle part here, we want to replicate that distance. If we were to have three carbons there instead of two, it might be probably too long because in the tropane ring, it's actually constricted a little bit. So if you were to look at a three-dimensional you know, if you were to imagine a three-dimensional model of this structure, the nitrogen and oxygen are actually closer than three carbons apart or that are stretched out. So with amyl amylcane, amyl amylocane, excuse me, they found that it had activity when these two carbons were actually in the middle. Does that kind of make sense? No. Benzoyl atropine has that ring. So if you, um, there really is not, the only rotation around bonds you're going to see is with this oxygen carbon bond here. But the rest of the molecule, imagine the atropine rings on one side and the benzoyl parts here, and those are turning. But this part, this atropine part of the ring is actually rigid. So we want to replicate that distance, yet simplify the molecule. This nitrogen and this oxygen are actually the same distance apart. So, so chemists will actually use this when they're deconstructing molecules like this. They'll actually look at, they would have benzoyl atropine, and they would look at the three-dimensional structure. They, either they'd model it with a computer, or they'd get a crystal structure of it. They'd crystallize the compound and put it in an instrument and get an actual distance of a solid um, compound. And then... Um, and then use that to work with. So I suspect that one of the first, that they also made a molecule like this. I'll just say probably synthesized this. <coughs> which has one, two, three carbons. And maybe we had some alkyl groups off of those carbons, just like with amyl paint. But if they made that molecule, they probably tested it. Let's just say there was some, um, there's some alkyl groups. something like that, and they probably found that it didn't have any analgesic properties or it lost its activity. And that's because in that case, the nitrogen and oxygen are only connected by this very twisty, longer carbon chain. <clears throat> but that's a little bit deeper than we need to know for the exam. So. Are there any questions about this? So tetracaine has an increased potency and duration of action um, just by the addition of an alkyl chain. So I suspect this actually increases its lithophilicity as well. And then I had to point out benzocaine also. Um, I'm not sure if Dr. Selvage touched on it. Um, but it really is an, a, a super simple chemical structure. It's just 
or amino ethyl benzoate. Um, super, super easy to synthesize in the lab and you can make it cheaply. Um, it's been around for a while and it's because it's so such a simple ester, because it's just an ethyl ester, it will fall apart in solution and it's only useful for topical applications. So I call these amino acids uh, derivatives of lidocaine, well, but in fact the actual alkaloid that, I, that it comes from is called isogramine. I indicated with a red uh, wavy mark here where you might cut this molecule. So if you can imagine, um, if you had a react, you don't, there's no direct chemical reaction to do that. But um, if you were to deconstruct it on paper and think about what would be left, this amino amid would be one of the would be one of the possibilities. So all we've done is we've retained this carbon, and then on this carbon here we've added a carbon nail. And immediately when they when uh, scientists discovered lidocaine, they found that it was less irritating and less allergenic. Um, and in fact, these amides, as I mentioned, are much more stable um, in aqueous solution. Uh, in chemistry, in actual organic chemistry class, we talk about these molecules a lot because they are simple structures and they do have a natural origin. Um, so it's nice to see a, a drug actually evolve from something that was in nature. And all this chemistry took place kind of at, between 1900 and 1950 um, anyway, when they were just discovering all of these anesthetics and analgesics. And that amino amide core structure is present um, in all of the other drugs that Dr. Selvage went through. Um, and you can see when we're moving in this direction. Um, longer duration and higher strength, moving from left to right. Um, some of these have, um, there are a few that have uh, different contraindications. I know there are some specific, specific toxicities, um, and I think there are indications, I think there's some that are indicated, or there's special indications for children also. So, um, and some drugs are used just for dental applications. So that's something that, that's some um, information that you'll tease out in uh, therapeutics that you talk about actually prescribing and dosing them. So. But I'd like you to think about these in a historical context, how they're made, and their basic properties at this point. So I boiled it down for you as much as I could. Is there any other questions on this? I think this is our last slide. Yeah, so, so are they, the amino amides are less allergenic because you, they don't break apart and you don't lose that ring. If I remember from MedChem 1, it was that ring that causes the allergic reaction when it breaks off. Is that right? Uh, the ring... Yeah, like the benzoic, the, the benzoic acid was what caused the uh, <laughs> Yeah, I suspect, I mean, if they're talking about, um, in fact, I'm sure that's what it is. You're getting the ester is actually breaking down. Right. Um, and the benzoic acid, um, is this something that Dr. Mazzino touched on? Yeah. Okay. Um, so what you're left with is an aniline. Uh, so I'll just say, if this ester were to hydrolyze, you're left with a carboxylic acid that has an aniline nitrogen. And then you would be left with some sort of alcohol or amino alcohol in this case. So um, two carbons here. Those would be your products. This carboxylic acid is what's causing the irritation. Um, I suspect it's also um, metabolites that are anilines um, like that, meaning an amine attached to a, a phenyl ring, are always suspicious as carcinogens. Um, just a general concern. Um, 
which will probably come up again when we're talking about other drugs. Um, when you, this is from my, from my experience creating drugs, uh, if you make a lead structure like this and it has an anyl and nitrogen in it, it immediately becomes classified into something that needs to be tested more thoroughly for carcinogenicity. Um, because aniline itself, just simply aniline, which is a, you know, just a phenyl ring with an amine. Um, it's made in tank car quantities and used as an industrial solvent and as a starting material in a lot of reactions. And historically, it's been used and people have been exposed to it in massive quantities. So it, in, the, in, that, in those interesting industrial cases, um, yes, it's extremely toxic, but they're getting practically splashed on them and, and all over there, you know, in, in like an incident or an accident. Um, in the context of dosing it as a drug in a controlled fashion and at a very low dose, it's probably not, you can't say that all anilines are toxic, but just the fact of this background and the history of anilin itself causes that um, more study of the drug to happen. So yeah, with the amino amide um, derivatives, those those break down much more slowly. They're much more um, much more persistent, so you don't have any of these side products. Okay. Um, so I would um, I would like to open the floor to questions now. I. Like I said, I don't like to go through. I mean, if I if I whip through all of the material, it would be this this blur, and you guys would be staring at me um, blankly at the end of this. And I'd rather you spend your time either studying or um, me kind of talking over some details. Um, I, I'm not going to say what's on the exam. I think that I, I will. Uh, one note about the exam is I do put things in order. Um, in general, I'll put them in sections. You know, we have our, we have four or five, five sections, um, and the learning objectives under each. So they'll be in that, they'll be in that order on the exam. Um, and I am looking at those questions in red that I gave you in your study guide. Those are the things that I would like. Those I I I just sat down and thought of all the things that I would like you to explain to me if you were the if you were a hundred percent A plus student, um, I would like all of those things. So I really got down to what I don't and what I don't want is not on there. Yes. I have a question. Um, yeah. As I was going through the, the study guide, I'm kind of wondering how brief, like, uh, how you wanted the answers. Like, if you wanted like one answer, or I mean, one word answers, or if you wanted like a, more than that, like a sentence, or how in depth. You mean if you were going through the, if you were going through the, uh, if you're going through the study guide, like how would you answer the questions? Is that what you mean? What, uh, like for example, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at uh, a question right now. Which, uh, what happens when acetylcholinesterase inhibitors are overdosed? There's been multiple <laughs> questions to that one question, but um, like, do you just want like a, um, Hyperstimulation, that answer it, or would you? Yeah, I, it's just the basic facts. I think if you're going through, it depends on my questions. I have some questions which are just asking for particular, um, an actual factual answer, and some are like, describe this and describe that. In the, in the strict descriptive case, you should be thinking broadly in terms of how you would express that. Um, but in some cases, it's just the facts. And if you're going through and answering these questions yourself, you can make you can just make a list of the facts. Uh, at the bare minimum, you should go through and make a make a list of, of facts you should know and get that in your mind and categorized. Um, does that answer your question? You know, I, it, n not all these are asking um, some, They're all asking questions, but some are kind of statements and describe this and explain this. Those you could you could think about. A but, but however you want to create your study guide, is, it, it can be just a list of facts and, and study aids and your little acronyms that you would use to, uh, to remember things that you could place that all in there and then you're still categorized, it's still in order that you will see it in the exam. 
some of their handbook or something. Um, we're not going to have to like describe them. The exam is just mostly multiple choice. Right? The exam will be mostly multiple choice. Um, there will be a few structures that you have to look at and perhaps comment on or circle or identify something. Um, I will put at least one short answer on there. Um, I, well, um, well, I have I prepared I prepared a number of them, but I'm I'm boiling it down to what's the, the most important thing in my mind. But um, yeah, mostly I mean mostly multiple choice and true and false. Um, yeah. Um, so with like the drug side that we did. Yes. Um, do we need to so like for like the panel versus do we need to know the drug specific unique No, no. I, um, that's a great question. I forgot to address that. That's actually on my checklist here. Uh, so the slides that we went over um, in the group review session, um, unfortunately, didn't have all the time I wanted. Um, the, the slides that got sent to me, Su Chin, thank you, um, are, um, there was only 13 of them, which might have been just the ones we went through in class. but. There were, in fact, frameworks created for all 18 or 20 of them. So you should you should maybe gather those up and have those as study guides. No, those that material is is not on the exam. There's not there's not um, delineating between two kind of side effects or um, you know any therapeutics. I'm very limited on pharmacology. Those are just a study guide in context. So in each of those drugs, really think about what I talk about, how the drug works. Um, chemical interesting things about the metabolism or um, how that structure relates to the neurotransmitter that it is affecting, like the actual natural agonist. I'm always coming back to um, um, cholinergic agonists um, look like acetylcholine, but they're slightly different. How are they different and why are they different? Um, nothing on the exam will be the extra stuff in the slides, but I really, I think, I, I get excited by those exercises because I like to place it into a into a dosing context. I like to see the end end game that you guys all will see, and, you know, and understand. Um, and I think it's important we start that now. That's why I, I asked for the information. And you guys are actually probably better at looking up some information than I am in terms of clinical use and prescribing. So maybe you're just as good right now. You'll be better in a, in a short while. Is that is that okay? Is that a clear? Yeah. So there really aren't I think that there aren't any specific like objectives at all to those cardiovascular drugs. Um, uh, other than like agonists obviously have similar structural features, but I guess they're not the same. Yeah, you're talking about adrenergic agonists, that big group of compounds that are all super similar and there's a bunch of slides for it. You're just distinguishing between selectivity. Um, you should, you know, why is that drug beta selective? Um, what else? Uh, let's see. Let me see if I can comment a little bit more on that. Just looking at our list here. Okay, so it was just these learning objectives here. So you must know what epinephrine looks like, what are the required chemical features, and then what chemical changes are made to adrenergic agonists to provide beta selectivity, and what chemical changes are made to adrenergic agonists to provide metabolic stability. So it really is, it comes down to a chart that has like, um, which ones are resistant to monoamine oxidase, which ones are resistant to COMPT, like what groups are you adding to confer resistance and selectivity in each case. So it's not, it's not a ton of facts, actually, in that section, just relating to these learning objectives. Is that okay? Yeah. Good. What else? Any thoughts? Questions? Well, I don't know what to do. If you, uh, if you guys would prefer more study time, I, I, I don't know.
you want to call the class. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to do that. I don't, I'm don't. i willing to stay after if somebody wants to linger. Um, but I think you guys study. have a big week and a lot of catching yeah. up to do. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. That would be good. Okay. Uh, I'm here after class for a little bit. If there's any concerns with study, what? just let me know. So, yeah, we'll sit there and come back. Yeah, and we'll study downstairs. Okay. 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 Okay